Uh, God has been incredibly faithful to us over our 48 years of marriage. Uh, thinking back one particular time was during unemployment. I think everyone has times when they wonder if the job's going to go away, where, where's the money coming from. Well, this time we were not young people. Uh, I was almost 60. My husband was in his early 60s. I knew my job was going away, company, common scenario today, uh, taken over by another company. They don't need the duplication. The kids are out of college. It's not a big issue. My husband is working. Well, uh, I got my resume. I've talked to the people, and I'm at the computer getting ready to put it on Monster when I hear the garage door open. As I came in, um, I abruptly and surprisingly announced to my dear wife that I too had just been laid off. We knew we had food on the table, uh, you know, compared to the rest of the world, we're all rich. Uh, but uh, this was not our retirement plan <laughs> to retire early and uh, you know, every, every thought is about the future. Will we have enough money? Will we be able to um, help our kids? Will we be able to? So, yeah, uh, a lot of thoughts really run, run through your mind and you, you hate not knowing. You know, you think you have a plan and you don't. One does not, in the early 60s, find challenging employment very easily. That's just a matter of fact. Even in taking New England, with my wife's help, with reliance on our faith, which had helped us many times in the past, I was optimistic that we would turn things around. And certainly, uh, the daily devotional time took um, extra special significance. Grace Chapel was very important. Um, we had friends checking in on us, seeing how we were doing. Um, we weren't expected to always have the stiff upper lip, and uh, we, could, we could be a little downhearted at times and be honest with people. Um, there were a couple of support classes we, we took at different times, but they uh, let us know we weren't alone in this situation. Then God just surprised us in incredible ways. Uh, I was working uh, two months after that. Um, the first real interview I had, I got the job, and then the Lord supply, supplied uh, again. I was able to uh, obtain a contract engineering position just probably two or three weeks after my wife began working. As it turns out, I was calm because um, the comfort I had with, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, with him being a shepherd, uh, I had real peace. So um, after six more months, uh, as a contract worker, I became a full-time employee and um, ended up retiring from from that that company so I think I would characterize everything by saying the word peace and comfort in spite of these these challenges you know God's faithful and he'll be faithful till the end uh, you look at the saints of the past and uh, he he got them through to the end he'll get us through to yeah we can't know what's ahead or you know but he's there same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, life isn't easy, is it? You work hard your whole life, you finally get the kids through school, you get the house paid off, and you're just beginning to set your sights on retirement when suddenly you lose your job, and then your spouse loses his job. And suddenly, at 60-something years old, you're wondering how you're going to make it for the next 20 or 30 years of life. As part of our Strong to the Finish series, we are profiling some folks from Grace Chapel who've been following Christ for a long time. And we're asking them to share with us how Jesus has been at work in their lives over the long haul. Now, we only heard a portion of the Tucker's story this morning, and we've got to believe that wasn't the first hardship they encountered along the way. Surely there were other career challenges over the decades. Surely there were times of marital tension. Surely there were parenting issues, uh, health problems, emotional heartache, spiritual struggles, not to mention the headaches and hassles of everyday life. Experiences like that can test your faith, and a lifetime of them can wear you down. We dedicated some children here today. And it's a great moment for those families and for those children. We're excited for them. 
It's a day of promise and possibility. We know that God has a great purpose for their lives. But we also know there are tough days to come. There will be disappointment and setback and heartache. The world these children are going to grow up in is getting scarier all the time. And being a Christ follower in the world today is not getting any easier. So life can be hard and long. It's not easy making it to the finish line, let alone finishing well with your faith intact. Nathan Emmanuel and Rosemary have told us that in their experience, through all the seasons of life, Jesus has been there for them. He's seen them through, not just this difficulty, but many others all along the way. And they're confident that he will see them through the rest of the way. Now, where do they get that kind of confidence? How do they know? How can we know that God will make us strong to the finish? This spring, we're working our way through the letters of the New Testament. And we're trying to answer the question, where is Jesus now? And what is he doing? So we began a couple of weeks ago with the ascension of Jesus, watching with his disciples as he rose into heaven and left this earth to take his seat at the right hand of God the Father. And we learned that he's there now, watching and ruling over all things. Last week, Pastor Ruthie helped us understand that while Jesus is physically present in heaven, he is spiritually present here with us through the power of his Holy Spirit empowering us for Christian life and service. Now, we were away last weekend. We were out in Denver for uh, our son Mark's graduation from seminary. And on Sunday afternoon, I got a text from a friend uh, back here at Grace, and uh, this is all he said. Amazing sermon from Pastor Ruthie. No need to hurry back. (laughs) Thanks, pal. Now, I gave a listen, and it actually is a really good sermon, but I'm back anyway, so. (laughs) Uh, Today, we'd like to ask a more specific question. Where is Jesus when life is hard? I mean, in the practical realities of everyday life in this world, where is Jesus, and can he really help us? And to answer that question, I'd like to take us to one of the less familiar uh, books of the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. It's a book that was written specifically for people who were facing difficulty. So much difficulty, in fact, they were tempted to give up on their faith, to turn away, to walk away from their faith in Christ. There's a little bit of mystery around this book of Hebrews because we don't know who the author was. It's the only letter of the New Testament that doesn't identify an author for us. For centuries, the church assumed that Paul must have written the letter like so many others of the New Testament. But today, scholars agree the style and content is very different from Paul's letters. Maybe Barnabas wrote the letter, some have suggested, because it's it's a letter of encouragement in keeping with Barnabas' character. Others have said perhaps Apollos wrote the letter. Apollos was an eloquent preacher of the early church, and the the book of Hebrews is, is lofty and eloquent. Some reputable scholars have suggested that Priscilla might have written the letter, one of Paul's longtime teaching associates. The fact that she was a woman might explain why there is no author's name given. The truth is we don't know who wrote the letter, but whoever wrote it, this book of Hebrews contains some of the highest Christology in all of the New Testament, teaching about Jesus. It offers offers us images of Jesus and truths about Jesus that we don't find anywhere else in Scripture. And we're going to look at a few of them here today. So let me take us to a pivotal passage in this book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. This will be our foundational passage for the message today, but we'll look at a few others along the way. So Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, Hebrews is the only book in the New Testament that specifically identifies Jesus as a high priest. It turns out to be a dominant theme of the letter, and we'll come back to it in a minute. But what I want us to notice here is that these readers are clearly in danger of losing their faith, of turning away. The, the writer says, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Now, from what we know of the times in which this letter was written and what we can tell from the rest of the letter, it seems that some of the difficulties they were facing was the difficulty of persecution, that they were being threatened, harassed, intimidated, thrown in jail, and perhaps even in danger of losing their lives for their faith. And so they're being tempted to give up on their commitment to Christ, to go back to their former way of Judaism or to no faith at all. And they're struggling. And we really can't blame them for that. I mean, every time we today hear a story or see a story about Christians being persecuted somewhere in the world, being thrown into jail, executed for their faith, sometimes in gruesome ways, we can't help but secretly ask ourselves, could I stand up under that kind of pressure? Are we prepared to name the name of Jesus knowing it might be the last thing we do in this life? I mean, that's the kind of difficulty these folks are facing. And yet the writer promises that Jesus is able to help them even in moments like this. In fact, he or she, whoever the writer is, suggests that Jesus is uniquely qualified to help them in this and every time of need. In fact, that's really the big idea of the book of Hebrews and the big idea of this message is that Jesus can make us strong to the finish because he is uniquely qualified to help us in our time of need. Uniquely qualified to help us in our time of need. Whatever challenge or difficulty or temptation you are struggling with right now, today, these days, Jesus can help you with it. He can help you with it like no other person or power can. Not just this time, but every time, all the way through to the finish. But now, why is that? Why is Jesus uniquely qualified? And how can he help us in our daily experiences? I mean, what does a first century carpenter know about layoffs and corporate mergers and monster.com? <laughs> how does Jesus enter into our experiences today? That's the question I'd like to explore a little bit. Because as I, as I spend time in this passage of Hebrews and through the rest of the book, I discovered three compelling images of Jesus and three simple truths about how he can make us strong to the finish. So let me just walk you through them. The first truth I discovered is that Jesus is with us feeling our pain. He's with us feeling our pain. Look again at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Now, the translators have very intentionally chosen the word empathize here rather than the word sympathize because there's an important difference. To sympathize with someone is to, is to feel badly for them because of the circumstances they are in. To empathize with someone is to feel badly with them because you yourself have been through that experience and have felt those very same feelings. So I can, I can sympathize with someone who is homeless and the difficulty that must be, but I can't empathize with someone who's homeless because I've always had a roof over my head. And so we're being told here that Jesus empathizes with us, but, but how can that be? I mean, he's the son of God. He's got a place up in heaven. Every so often, politicians will try to tell us that they feel our pain. 
we tend to doubt it. <laughs> Knowing there's a limo waiting to whisk them off to their next appointment and that they'll probably never have to stand in a checkout line at the grocery store. But the writer of the Hebrews tells us that Jesus really was here on earth with us and that when he was here, he was tempted in every way just as we are. Now he sets this whole thing up back in chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. But the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way. The writer wants to make it very clear that Jesus is fully human, just like us. And so to help us understand that, he chooses this remarkable metaphor. He presents Jesus to us as our brother. Now, it's the only place in the New Testament Jesus is specifically identified as our brother. And that metaphor opens up a whole new way of seeing and relating to Jesus because brothers and sisters know each other in unique ways. They have a special kind of relationship with each other. And my brother and I are about two and a half years apart. We haven't seen each other much in... We've lived apart now for almost 40 years, and he lives a 1,000 miles away, so we don't see each other all that often. But if we were standing here today, you would know we are brothers because we look the same, because we've shared so many life experiences together. I mean, we spent, for the first 18 years or so of, our, of, of life, we, we spent every day together. We slept in the same room. We ate at the same table. We played with each other. We beat on each other. We got in trouble together. <laughs> and in the years since then, we've stood beside each other at weddings and funerals and all kinds of important milestones in the journey of life. If I called him right now, he'd pick up the phone. And then I'd ask why he wasn't in church. Because <laughs> that's what brothers do. It's an incredibly intimate metaphor the writer chooses, wanting us to understand how very close Jesus is to us, how well he knows us, how deeply he understands us, how ready he is to help us. And to drive that home even further, the author reminds us that Jesus had flesh and blood just like us. He really can empathize with our weaknesses. There was a popular song some years ago that said, what if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us. Just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home. The irony of the song is that Jesus was one of us. No, he is one of us. We learned a couple of weeks ago, Jesus is still human. Yes, he's at the right hand of God, fully divine, but also fully human. He feels our pain. The other night I was doing some teaching here at Grace with a group of people. And afterwards, several folks came up to talk to me afterwards. They wanted some help with particular challenges they were facing along the lines of the things we'd been talking about. And they describe some very difficult situations, complicated situations, painful legal problems, financial problems, relational issues. They were asking for some help. And the truth is, I, I didn't feel as though I was very helpful because I had really never lived through the kinds of experiences they were describing to me. Now, I did the best I could. I, I encouraged them, keep on going. I, I promised to pray for them. But the truth is, I was very limited in my ability to, to speak into their lives because I've simply never dealt with the challenges they're dealing with. Jesus is not so limited. During his 30 or so years on this earth, he drank fully of the human experience. 
like the children we dedicated a few moments ago. Jesus knows how it is to come into this world helpless, vulnerable, dependent, born into a, a fallen world and an imperfect family. Like every teenager, Jesus knows how it feels to be misunderstood by your parents and not to be taken seriously by your brothers and sisters. Like every working stiff, Jesus knows how it feels to have to get up and go to work every day and to wonder sometimes where the next job is coming from. Like every single person, Jesus knows how it feels not to be married in a world where everyone else seems to be married. Like everyone who's ever stood at the grave of someone they love, Jesus knows how it feels to stand and weep and grieve the loss of a loved one. Like everyone who's worried about a, an aging parent, Jesus knows how it feels to be concerned for, for his mother in her later years. Like every refugee in the world, Jesus, Jesus was born on the road and spent the first years of his life in a foreign land. Like every battered spouse or child, Jesus knows how it feels to be physically and emotionally abused. Like so many young men of color, Jesus knows how it feels to be falsely accused and wrongfully arrested and unfairly tried. Like every Christ follower who's ever gone through a dark night of the soul, Jesus knows how it feels when God seems to go silent. And like every human being who's ever been at the threshold of death, Jesus knows how it feels to take your last breath, not knowing exactly what's going to happen on the other side. Jesus feels our pain. Whatever experience you may be going through, know that Jesus can meet you there. Like a brother, he's with you in your time of need feeling your pain. You can bring it to him knowing he understands. The second thing I discovered as I worked with this text is that Jesus is for us, interceding at the Father's right hand. He's for us, interceding at the Father's right hand. Look again at Hebrews 4. Therefore, since we have a high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Now, once again, Hebrews is the only book in the Bible that specifically identifies Jesus as the high priest. Now, the writer's drawing on an image that would have been very familiar to his Jewish background readers. A priest, of course, was a, a mediator, Someone who stood between earth and heaven, representing people to God. And so all year long, the priests would, would, would bring sacrifices to God on behalf of the people, thank offerings and guilt offerings, to, to keep the relationship open between the people and God. And then once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into that most holy place, walking through the curtain into that holy place, and would present the blood of a sacrificed animal as an offering for the collective sins of the people for that year and would obtain forgiveness for the people that year. And it was a terrifying moment to enter into that most holy place, to walk through that curtain. I mean, what sinful person can stand in the presence of a holy God, especially a person who's bearing on their shoulders the sins of the people? But as important as that annual ritual was, there was no way that the blood of a sacrificed animal could ever atone for people's sins. The sacrificial system was simply a placeholder. It was a way of reminding the people of the consequences of sin, death. You cut yourself off from God. It was, it was a way of anticipating the day when, when the perfect Lamb of God would offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, of all collective humanity, and bear the judgment of, of, 
against all evil in the world once and for all. And the Gospels tell us that in that moment when Jesus laid down his life, when he died on the cross, at that very moment, the Bible tells us, that veil in the temple blocking the way to the holy place was torn in two, opening the way for anyone, for everyone, to approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing they'll find forgiveness and whatever else they need from God. Listen to what the writer says a little bit later in the letter. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this high priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And that's where Jesus is now, interceding for us, representing us before the Father. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. It's not a signal that we're done praying now. <laughs> we're reminding ourselves that our prayers reach the Father through Jesus who makes the way clear for us. The other day I got a newsletter from a missionary couple that I know. They were describing a difficult situation. They were on their way back to the States for about a year because of some medical issues in their family. But as they were making their way back, they suddenly discovered that the wife's visa had been denied. She's a, she's a citizen of a third country, and for some reason, her visa had been denied. So the father and the child had to continue all the way here to the States for the medical care, and she finds herself now stuck, literally floundering halfway home, unable to get into the country. This has been going on for weeks. She doesn't know why her visa has been denied. She doesn't know where the visa application is. She doesn't know what the holdup is or how long it's going to be. It's a terribly frustrating situation. But as I was thinking about that situation and the truth we're talking about today, it occurred to me, if only that woman had someone in the visa office who knew her, who was watching out for her interests, Someone who not only knew her, but knew firsthand what she was going through because he or she had gone through the same experience themselves. Someone who not only knew her and knew her circumstance, but someone who had access to the decision makers. Someone who could walk into that desk, find her application in the stack, and bring it personally to the one who grants those visas and get it done for her. What that woman needs is a friend in high places. And that's what we have in Jesus. We have one who knows us, who knows what we need and how it feels to be in the situation we're in, and who has access to the Heavenly Father and can obtain for us whatever we need, whether it's forgiveness for sins or wisdom for a difficult season of life or comfort in a season of loss or as Emmanuel and Rosemary talked about, a sense of peace in an uncertain season. And so Jesus, again, is uniquely qualified to help us in our time of need. So like a brother, Jesus is with us, feeling our pain and like a priest, Jesus is for us, interceding at the right hand of God. The third thing I discovered is that Jesus is ahead of us, making a way for us to follow. Look one more time at Hebrews 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, who has gone through the heavens, remember the ascension we looked at a couple of weeks ago? how the disciples saw Jesus rise from the Mount of Olives into the very cloud of God's presence. You know what that's describing? The finish line. Jesus has made it to the presence of God and to the glories of the kingdom. He's there now already. Look again at verse 15. We have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus is the one and only human being who's actually lived the life that we were all meant to live, a life of love, marked by perfect love for God and for others, 
Jesus lived that life. Jesus knows how to run this race. He can tell us about the obstacles and the challenges that are ahead of us. He can show us the way. Let's say you're planning next year on, on running the Boston Marathon. And you decide that in order to get ready for that race, it might help to talk to someone who's actually run the race. Now, you could talk to someone who, who entered the marathon but, but dropped out halfway through. Maybe you learn some things from their mistakes, and you might. But would it make more sense to talk to someone who actually finished the race? Someone who has a training regimen that actually works, that can get you to the finish line? Someone who could talk you through all the moments of that race, the chaotic start, the tedious middle miles, the Newton Hills. Someone who can tell you how miserable you will feel those final miles as you run toward that Sitco sign. You want to talk to someone who's actually finished the race. That's Jesus. And that leads to this third image of Jesus I want us to see here, brother, priest, and now this third one. It's found back in chapter 2, verse 10. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now, the word I want to call your attention to here is that word pioneer. It's a very interesting word. Literally, it means someone who blazes a trail for others to follow. Sometimes it's translated by the word author. Many scholars say the best translation would be champion. Champion. It's the same word found in Greek literature that describes Hercules, the great hero of mythology. The writer's telling us that Jesus is our champion, that he has done for us what we could never do for ourselves, what no one else has ever done. He lived a perfect life, loving God and others. He paid the penalty for sin by his death on the cross. He conquered death by rising from the grave. He opened the door to eternal life by ascending to his Father. He is our champion. It brings to my mind a story I know I've told before, but it's one I love to tell. It's a story of a king who held a great race in his kingdom. The prize would be a bag of gold. And the finish line would be the very courtyard of the king's palace. All the runners set out to win the race. But to their surprise, on their way, about halfway through, they encountered this great pile of rocks and stones in the road. They managed, some of them, to climb over top of the pile, others to find their way around it, and eventually, one by one, made it into the courtyard of the king. But the prize was not handed out. Finally, after many, many hours, the last lone runter, runner came into the courtyard. And he held up a bleeding hand. And he said, King, I'm sorry to be so long in coming. But on my way, I encountered a great pile of rocks and stones. And it took me a long time to clear it away. And I wounded myself in the process. And then he held up another hand, and in it was a bag of gold. And he said, and king, at the bottom of that pile, I found your bag of gold. My son, the king said, you have won the race. Because that runner runs best who makes the way safe for those who follow. That one runs best who makes the way safe for those who follow. Jesus has run the race like no other. By his sinless life, by his sacrificial death, by his triumphant resurrection, by his glorious ascension, he has made the way safe for all who choose to follow him. Now, have you done that? Have you personally chosen to follow him? Because you see, it's, it's, it's not automatic. I mean, Jesus is all these things. He's brother and priest and champion. 
but he is only those things to those who turn to him in faith. It's a decision every person has to make. A decision every one of these children that we dedicated will have to make at some point in their lives. It's true for those who, who admit their need, who acknowledge their sinfulness, and who actually ask him to be their brother and priest and champion. Have you done that? If not, you are on your own in this race and on your own in the life to come. So I invite you today, no, I encourage you today, whatever it is you are experiencing in life, whatever heartache or hardship or challenge or temptation, you can bring it to Jesus. Because like a brother, he wants to be with you and feel your need. Like a priest, he is for you, interceding at God's very throne. And like a champion, he is making a way for you to follow him into good, abundant, and eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, you have invited us in this passage this morning to bring all our requests to you, to approach your throne of grace with confidence, not with fear and trembling like the high priest of old. You invite us to come bounding into your presence like a dearly loved child jumping into the lap of a loving mother or father and to tell you what's on our heart and what we're struggling with and dealing with. And so, Lord, in the quiet of these few moments, in the privacy of our own prayers, we want to bring our requests to you now for ourselves or for those that we love. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing these requests and needs to our hearts today. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing our prayers and bringing them to the throne of grace. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for loving us and coming near to us in order that we might follow your Son now and forever. We pray, Lord, for any here this morning who have not yet made that decision to follow you, may you bring them to a place where they're ready to admit their need, to find forgiveness, and follow you into new and eternal life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How do we stand and celebrate the freedom we have to bring our requests to God?